but I was a cop in Brooklyn in the 1980s. Uh, when the crack epidemic broke out, uh, it broke out everywhere and broke out on us too, on the police force. We had no idea what we were dealing with. And uh, so the era that I was a police officer was 82 to 92, and I eventually get arrested, and then the story goes from there. Ten years. <clears throat> yeah. What was it like being a cop in New York before the, before the crack epidemic right. and after? Yeah, so it, it was a very uh, eerie time because... When before crack hit, you had the AIDS epidemic hit, right? So we went from one epidemic to another. Now we're in another one today, right? We're in this fucking COVID yeah. thing, right? So as a frontline cop, we dealt with a lot of these issues in the street first before society as a whole dealt with it, you know? And you sort of learned as you were going how to handle things. And uh, so it was a thrilling time, to say the least. I mean, you know, nerve wracking. You you, you you grew up quick, right? So uh, you went in there as a twenty one year old young man, sort of, and then you you know, in in six months you've seen more than your mom and dad have seen in their life combined, unless they were soldiers and stuff like that. You were you know? twenty one when you when you joined the police force, right? And what made you want to join the police police force? It seemed it, the documentary conveyed that it was, it was like a lot of young guys who had no direction, right? And they were just like looking for something to do. Yeah, well, it wasn't like there wasn't anything to do. It was more like looking for leadership, looking for mm. guidance. You know, you know, guys in their twenties are fairly immature. Men don't mature till they're about sixty, right? <laughs> Some of us still were sixty-five. Is it sixty? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sixty now, and she still she's telling me I'm still not mature. So, but I'm working on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, you had a bunch of young guys. It, you know what it was like? It was like a frat house with guns. How's that? Wow. That's like, great. I love that. It was like that. a fucking free. <laughs> I love who, that. Wouldn't, who wouldn't have loved it? It was a fucking pisser. But the, the honest thing is it was dangerous. And, and you know, so we can laugh about certain things because it's past, you know. But the, the unfortunate thing is that we all took our job for granted and didn't really appreciate our position. You know, like when you're a soldier, you go to war, you're only fighting for the guy next to you to come home. And then as you look back on what you accomplished, you know, from what I'm told, it's the same thing as being a police officer. When, when you're in there in the, in the battle, you're battling for the guy next to you and yourself, and you don't realize the impact you have on society mm. and the city and the people in general. Right. You know, and, and that's a big subject, right? But everybody think everybody's little, right? We're only one little wheel in the big cog, you know? Yeah, you were a big part of history. That was a huge, that was a major part in American history, that, that little area right there in New York, that time that time frame in New York, yeah, New it, York City. It, yeah, it, it, it sort of had tentacles into the rest of society for years to come, right? Yeah. And like a whole generation of people were decimated by this, including law enforcement. Right. Because if you look back and I don't know if you had the time to do any research during that time, police departments were devastated by the crack and the money from crack, you know, inter by their by choices, bad choices that guys made because they were exposed to such. I mean, when you're making seventeen nine a year and the guy that you pulled over has got seventeen nine in his pocket, you know, yeah, what is with no fucking like? job. You know, uh, and he's 16 and you're like and no license for the car, but he's got a brand new one. You know, it's just. You say to yourself, what the fuck am I doing? Like, you, it's a reality check. What makes sense? So, uh, you, know, you know, of course we're supposed to do the right thing, but we don't always, you know? And that's yeah. where the 51% good guy or 49% bad guy, and some days they switch sides. Dude, you know? it's crazy that you survived 10 years doing that through that period in New York City. I mean, don't you think? Don't you ever like be like, how the fuck am I still well, alive? Well, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, how many years? You did 12 years in prison, right? Yeah. yeah. So I did like 10 with the city and 12 with the feds. Anyway, <laughs> but um, <laughs> so I should get a pension, right? Um, <laughs> so I looked at it like, how, so the question was, how did we survive? I bought life insurance. Like, so how many men do you know at like 23 and 24 years old? that have like a million dollar life coverage back then. So I had two policies that were over, worth over a million dollars in case I died. <laughs> so, yeah, so, and, and double indemnity was great because if I, I, I always hoped that if I did die, I died by an accident because that mm -hmm. gave you double indemnity, right? So then your family would be covered double. So that was something a lot of the police officers did? Yeah, because it was crazy. And yeah. especially guys that were doing the sort of the things that I was involved in, you know, I mean, I hung out with the Dominican drug kingpins, you know, so yeah. one day you could be, you know, caviar and, and champagne. The next day it could be a shootout. You know, you didn't know what was coming from one day to the next. And I'm not saying that there was, I was involved in shootouts per se, although 
some of sketchy things, but uh, but the reality is it could have been it could have been. So I, I I and I always was like worried about you know. So one of the reasons I stayed in the police force through all this was because I had a child and like. Who, who, how do you raise a child as, as, as a kingpin drug dealer? It's not like, you don't put that on the resume. What does your daddy do, you know? So, uh, because at some point I made a decision to really not care any longer about being a police officer. And that was when, I, you know, if you see the documentary, I drove the Corvette up to the to the lieutenant's parking spot and said, fuck you, because I'm, I was done. Like, can you catch me, please? Because I just really should, I'm, I think I'm going to be better at that than at being a police officer. Even though I, I think I was a damn good cop, you know, as far as, being able to do the police work, you know, mm. I, was, I was I was slick. I became slick. I learned the street. I learned the moves of people. Yeah. I learned to know that guy over there is either got a gun or he's got a, he's holding some dope on him uh, just right. by the walk right. and 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 the and the movement of the head. I mean, it's just it's just were you just lot, know. Were a lot of guys in the police force back then numb to it? Like, like numb to be able to reading body language or reading somebody like a real, like a real New York, like a real hustler in New York. Mm -hmm. You feel like that's someone who can get along with anybody. That's someone who could talk to anybody and do a deal with somebody. Like, like I, me. Like you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's something that. I in need. uniform. Right. Right. I mean, that seems like that's something fucking that's crazy. <laughs> super valuable, especially if you're a cop and you're actually doing your job and you're, and you're, you know, you're aware of this skill that you have. Did the other guys in the police force have this skill or were they just sort of like. Um, coming so, to, coming so, to work and well, so there was listen. So I guess I alluded it to partially before in the eighties. There were numerous, like hundreds of police officers arrested. Hundreds. I, 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 it comes close to a thousand police officers were arrested from 1990, 1985 when crack really started to hit to nineteen ninety two. Close to a thousand cops were arrested for being involved in drugs. But of course, you know, I was the I was a the picture of the of the you know the the white lily long island guy that 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 worked in the brooklyn police precinct and you know he was purveyor of evil against mm -hmm. the poor people in the ghetto get the fuck out of here the fuck they tra they trained me for christ's sake right right <laughs> no i mean what you did i mean f well first of all in the beginning of like throughout the documentary i love how the court testimony is weaved throughout the whole thing it's funny how people love that I, I, and it's i it's great I, 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 you know what because I'm not a film guy, so that almost bothered me to see it. But I can see why every single person that I've had an interview with, which is probably about 100 by now, um, have always said exactly that. It's so, the backbone of the whole thing. It's yes, great. It, it's, it's weaved through the, through the whole thing. And, and the best part about it, to me at least, was how matter-of-fact and straightforward and honest you were exactly. about everything. Like, it's just, you're straight yeah. up just telling them, yes, I did this and this. Like, yeah. how, Well, you know what? Uh, so... so the comment on that is that, so, like, people ask, what was that like? You know, why were you so deadpan honest? You know, I, I had, like, 30 federal prosecutors sitting in the fucking room looking to see me fuck up, okay? That's number one. So if I told anything incorrect or lied or obfuscated, I could be charged with it. And on, on the other side was, I've already been arrested and charged with, you know, I mean... What, what people don't know when we do these interviews is that I was suspected for nine murders in Brooklyn, okay? I didn't do any. But the New York Post ran with the story that they're looking for nine bodies to attach to me. And the last thing on my mind that I'm worried about is a couple hundred kilos or whatever, fucking, you know, 200,000 in cash. I, at this point, I'm still fighting in my head that they're suspecting me for being involved in nine murders. And it was like, this is nothing compared to what these people are talking about. So... So yeah, so so from that perspective, you can understand why it was so easy for him to say, yeah, I did hundreds of crimes. I I actually lied. I did thousands. <laughs> so and the only reason I didn't say thousands because my father was in the fucking audience behind me, you know, watching me testify. Jeez. So I hope man. they don't. I hope I don't get a, a federal uh, sentencing enhancement for not telling the complete truth. I mean, I felt for you in that documentary. I, you know, making the small amount of money that you were making being a police officer in New York and seeing, like you just said, seeing all these guys that you were busting that had, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on them. I, if I was in your shoes, I probably would have done the same fucking thing. I would have been hustling with them, stealing money from them from, and well, running around gallivant, well, snorting coke. Yeah. Yeah. Banging whores. Yeah. Bang uh, yeah. Yeah. That's what that, listen, it was that way. So, but I had, I was the face of it, right? So every, right. everybody has to be the full guy. And, and I don't lessen my responsibility by saying that. I take a full responsibility for what I did. But, 
you know, but most guys got terminated. Back mm-hmm. then they'd get terminated. Mm-hmm. But my situation was I got away with it so long that they were pissed. And then more so that Suffolk ended up catching me on a wire to my partner's, ex-partner's house, Kenny Urell. Uh, that's the guy who ratted on you. Yeah, he put a wire on later, but his phones were tapped. And then that's how they got to me. 